Okay, we have three things that we'd like to do today. Uh, one is uh, go over case number one, the case you submitted yesterday. And um, then uh, discuss uh, job order costing. And finally, introduce case two, which compares traditional costing with activity-based costing. And to introduce it and to entertain any and all questions and comments that you may have about case two before you finalize it for submission uh, tomorrow evening. And the reason I asked you to submit it tomorrow evening is because Thursday I would like to discuss again in detail activity-based costing based on uh, the analysis and uh, your answers and the analysis of case two. So that's our plan. Let's start with uh, answers uh, to case one. So I'll go over the suggested answers here, but you may have different ideas or alternative answers, or you may have questions, so you may want to clarify things or suggest alternative approaches. So just uh, raise your hand, and if I don't see your hand, just holler, interrupt me anytime, because obviously I want your participation in that. Well, in everything, and uh, of course also in uh, the discussion of case one. So, uh, requirement number one has to do, or had to do with uh, the choice of uh, cost drivers. And specifically, you were asked, why use hours worked and hours traveled rather than to use the number of visits as the cost driver to allocate your costs to the different jobs. And uh, the, why is it more appropriate? And the answer is that it is, if you use the number of visits, uh, visits are not the same. There are short visits, long visits, the visits were Little work is, less work is done there. Visits to customer premises where more work is done. Also, visits uh, do not reflect necessarily the work that has been done in the office. So therefore, if you use hours worked and hours traveled, it's a it's a, a better indicator and it's more closely associated with uh, the costs of working on those uh, projects, A1, A2, and B1. So that's uh, basically the justification. Okay, requirement number two is uh, how do you classify costs to direct costs and indirect costs in this particular case? And remember the, uh, yes? Yeah, for the first one, for, um, hours worked and travel fall Well, in our case, uh, suggested that you just add them together. If you have the, if you add them together without weighing them, right? So they carry equal weights. Now, obviously, ideally, they may not carry equal weights. We simply have difficulty in terms of how we weigh them, right? So if you ask how we weigh them, yes, possibly we should weigh them, but uh, there's no easy way on how you weigh them. 
presumably you travel to customers to do the work. So there is work that is necessary to do at customers' premises, and you need to get yourself there. Uh, now, is an hour travel, obviously an hour that you do of work is, uh, is direct processing, and the hour that you do of travel is auxiliary, right? But you have to get there. So the question is, would you weigh them differently? The answer is maybe, but it's difficult to figure out how, so we just weigh them the same. So by me asking you to add them up, I basically told you give them equal weight because we don't necessarily know how to do it better. Good question. Okay, uh, so question, what... Uh, well, in terms of direct or indirect, the criterion is always which costs are exclusive to the cost object, in this case to the jobs. Which costs and which inputs and which cost of those inputs are exclusively dedicated to a particular job and which are not exclusive. Those that are exclusive are direct, those that are not exclusive are indirect. So, it's tricky here. There are certainly certain inputs. Let's start with the inputs and then we'll talk about the cost of those inputs. There's certainly certain inputs that are exclusively related to the jobs. And you're, 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 the, you're the consultant, you're running the company, you're the only worker there. So you could uh, probably distinguish hours of work that were used only for a particular job, right? Not for any other job, but just for that particular job. Those hours and the cost of those hours are direct. But, for example, hours of travel, yes, if you can say that certain hours were traveled just to a particular job, then they are direct and their costs are direct. But remember, we had this uh, geographic triangle, right? Where you might travel from the office to customer A, do A1, A2, then travel to customer B, do B1, then travel back to the office, then how do you know uh, then many of the travel hours don't relate exclusively to a particular job, right? So they may not be classified as direct and the, clo and the costs are not classified necessarily as direct. They may be indirect. Well, if you, uh, let's take another cost item, uh, office costs. Well, there are, again, it depends on what costs. There are some costs that you may directly associate to particular jobs. For example, telecommunication or systems. You may have done in your office systems work, or you may call telecommunication, make calls that are directly related to job A1. And you can, if you can identify those, uh, the cost of those are direct costs. But for example, rental. Since the reason that rental is indirect, I mean, you, you pay so much rent per month and so much rent per year, you cannot exclusively identify dollars rents with a particular job. You run the office to support all jobs, right? You don't rent one. You don't rent one office to do only jobs for to do only work for A1, and one office to do only work for B1. So obviously, the rental costs are indirect. So sometimes it's straightforward to identify which costs are direct and indirect, and sometimes it's not easy. Some of the costs 
in a certain category may be direct and some of the costs may be indirect. Okay, requirements three and four are have to do just with the calculation, estimation of the costs and the allocation of the costs to the jobs using the economic approach and using the accounting approach. Let's start with the economic approach. Well, office is office, 54,000. Labor. Remember, the economic approach says opportunity cost is a real cost. We're going to include opportunity cost whenever appropriate. And the labor costs here are opportunity costs. The labor costs that you put on behalf of your business, because you're the only one who's working there, that you, you provide consulting services to customers A and B, uh, the hours that you put in for your business. If you didn't, you would have you would have these hours to put into another work. And actually, it tells you in this case specifically if, that whenever you don't work for your business, you can be hired for any number of hours that you wish to put. You can be hired by other companies for consulting activities at $100 per hour. So obviously, the hours that you use for the business is hours that you forgo providing services to somebody else and being paid hundred dollars. So obviously you take the number of hours worked and traveled which is 2620 you multiply by them by, them by 100 and you get a cost of labor which is 262,000, which in this case is not explicit, but it is an implicit opportunity cost. And then the travel, you're asked to take the example that we used in our first meeting of using the car, same numbers. Uh, you buy a car for $25,000, you use it for a year. Uh, the economic oriented approach gave you a total cost actually I think I made a mistake it is 7450 rather than 7400 so if you did 7450 that's fine uh, this cost this these travel costs the cost of using the car because it's the economic approach it includes economic depreciation which was three thousand dollars the difference between the value of the car when you purchased it and the value, estimated value at the end of the year. And it included the opportunity cost on tying $25,000 to the car. And of course it included all the other out-of-pocket costs so that gave you $7,400. So if we stay with the economic approach, we get a total cost, estimated cost of $300. 23,400 and that cost is divided by the cost driver which is the total number of hours worked and traveled and you get the economic cost rate the budgeted economic cost rate per hour worked and traveled which in this example comes, in this calculation, comes to $123.44 per hour, per hour worked and traveled. So, then if you proceed to allocate this to the jobs, you use this allocation rate, $123.44, and you multiply it by the, you're given in the activity uh, table, 
you're given the number of hours worked and traveled for each job, 620 for A1, A20 for A2, and 1180 for B1, and uh, you get the costs, the estimated cost allocated for each job using economic costing. Now, on the accounting costing, this will not appear. Excuse me. This will not appear because this is opportunity cost. There is no explicit out-of-pocket cost. Nobody paid you 262,000 dollars. You're working for yourself. So there's no explicit cost. In conventional accounting systems, it would not be recorded or recognized as a cost. Partly because it's an estimate. You're saying, yes, if I worked, had I worked for somebody else those hours, I would have been paid $100 per hour. So, you have to take this cost out. So, that's the major difference. The other small difference in the accounting approach is the travel cost. Uh, the travel cost, instead of being 7,400, is actually 5,200 because the cost of the use of the car using the accounting approach includes accounting straight line depreciation of $2,000 rather than $3,000 and it does not <coughs> allow for the opportunity cost of the alternative use of funds 5% on $25,000. <coughs> so <coughs> the costs that remain so the, the accounting cost would be the accounting travel cost plus the office cost. The office costs are out-of-pocket costs. They're recorded and they'll be cost. So the sum of those divided by the number of hours worked and traveled gives you a rate per hour worked of travel much lower, dramatically lower than in the economic cost uh, costing. $22.60 compared to $123.44. So you use this rate and you get uh, the cost numbers using accounting costs. And not surprisingly, they're dramatically lower. Okay, let me open the floor to any questions or comments. Is this any alternative ways people have done it, be happy to discuss it. If not, move further. Yes? You mean uh, uh, jobs A1 and A2? But what you mean, what is different about A1 and A2? Obviously, they're different jobs. Yeah, yeah, different jobs. So, if you calculate the uh, value of power, I think it's two different. So, A1, A2, and Z1 are totally different. So well, we don't know. Maybe there are some, we, in other words, we don't have the information. Uh, you were not given the information. You were given just the information that uh, you're doing three jobs, A1, A2, and B1. Uh, and that these were, uh, and these were accounting information system consulting jobs. And you're right. They may, be, they may have been similar, and they may have been different. Let's take your assumption that each job is a... a is an AIS consulting job, but is a different consulting job. 
So what would you suggest we do? Let's assume that, that we don't know, but let's just for the sake of argument assume that they're very different in terms of the type of consulting required, but you're a versatile guy, you can do various types of consulting. So they're different. Uh, what would you suggest? In other words, I, I'm accepting your assumption that they may be different, but the question is, so what can we do? Uh, weigh the hours, no, what you may say, we may give different weight to the hours, right? Yeah. In other words, we may say an hour spent on A1, devoted to A1, is not the same as an hour devoted to A2. So if we have more information or we want to do a more sophisticated approach and they're really different, we can say, hey, wait a minute, an hour that I devoted to, an hour that I devoted to A2, A2 is a much more complex job than A1 and therefore an hour, an hour that I devoted to A2 is more valuable, is more heavy. That could be the case. And in that case, what do we have to do? We would have to say, I'm doing three types of work, like exemplified by A1, A2, and B1. And if I did this work outside, I would get paid differently because they're different type of works. And you would have to find out, maybe for A1 you would have paid $100 per hour, but for A2, which is more sophisticated and more demanding, people would pay you $150 an hour. Then you would have to weigh all the hours that worked on A2 at $150. So you're absolutely right, that could be the case. We were just not given the information, so you didn't have the information to do that. But that is a possible scenario. This is a good point. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, I'm going to post that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to post all of that on Blackboard. There's no question about it. Uh, actually, tonight I'm going to post, well, what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to post this, the answers on Blackboard, and I'm going to, pose, to post also the answers to assignment one on Blackboard. That's what you did? No, uh, we did the, the former, former way, but not what we did. I think. What did you do differently? Yeah, we did differently, but I think. No, tell us, we're, we're interested. Can you tell us quickly how you did it differently? No, we, just, we didn't uh, like to multiply, we, we just added up all the costs uh, of carrying the table. And, uh, like Which table? Right. Yes. But what did you do? What did you do? Did you have uh, 262,000? Yes, we have. And then we just had, uh, But how did you allocate? Okay. Yes, so we you count that labor cost as the opportunity cost uh, in, right. in the account. Right. But on the basis of what, if you didn't do cost drivers, so on the basis of what did you allocate it to the jobs? Because uh, you were asked to allocate it to the jobs, right? Yes.
No, no, but let me just get you there because I want, I want to understand it. You added, okay, you, you distinguished between direct and indirect costs. Yes. You added them up, but how did you assign them or allocate them to the different jobs? That's what I want to know. Okay. Okay. So we allocate different ways. So or, okay, so the travel, so wait a minute, the travel costs you allocated based only on hours uh, travel. Depreciation. Depreciation? Yeah, depreciation. You allocated based on hours car travel. Time. You mean the depreciation part of the car? Yeah. Okay. So you so you uh, took different items, yeah. and for example, items related to travel. Yeah. Some of them you allocated to the jobs based only on travel hours, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's a difference, right? Yeah. Any other differences? Yeah, but okay, fine. Uh, I don't see a problem in that. That's uh, you could arguably, it is arguably a reasonable approach to say that I want to use only travel hours to as a basis or a cost driver to allocate travel costs and uh, and do it separately that way. And if you did it this way, it would be considered correct. Okay? Okay, very good. Now, uh, requirement five. Okay, requirement five says, <laughs> what if you decided to pay yourself a salary? of $100 per hour for the hours that you worked in travel. Because the original, the original case said, you're working, you're not paying yourself a salary. If you need money, you take it out of the profits of the business. But now we're saying, okay, no, you, you, could, you could decide that you want to pay yourself a salary. After all, you're working hard, right? Why not? Well, what will happen? Well, the economic approach will not change because, okay, now it's a salary, but it included the cost. The cost will not change because it included the cost in the opportunity cost of work. Yeah, from the accounting point of view, it's now an explicit cost, right? You pay yourself your salary, it's recorded as a salary. It's not an estimate anymore. You pay yourself $100 per hour for the hours you put into the business. It is a bona fide expense, right? So it will be recognized now. There's no reason from an accounting point of view not to recognize. It's not an estimate in the air. It's an it's objective, recordable number. So. The accounting approach will now include the accounting approach will now have much higher costs because the accounting approach will include the two hundred sixty two thousand dollars as a salary. Uh, the only difference will be that it will include fifty two hundred as the as the car expenses, as the car cost, cost of using the car, rather than the 7,400. So that'd be the only difference between the accounting and the economic approach. So it's very interesting. Just by deciding to pay yourself a salary, from an accounting point of view, you suddenly increase the cost significantly and decrease your profit significantly. 
which is a peculiarity of the accounting approach of, of how accounting recognizes things or doesn't recognize things. An interesting aside here is that uh, that's one way by deciding whether you pay yourself a salary and if you pay yourself a salary how much you pay. You don't have to decide on $100 per hour, you can decide on $70 per hour. But by deciding on your salary, uh, on the height of your salary, you manipulate your profit, right? You can pay yourself, the higher the salary you pay to yourself, the lower the profit, right? Because the higher the cost and the lower the salary, the higher the profit. So that also uh, reminds us something that we know that the profit or the bottom line number is a very soft number. Within certain limits, it's what you, what you want it to be. Now, what will be, uh, so the other question, which has nothing to do with the requirement, but since we are discussing that, we might as well raise it. What will be your, if you are to decide whether you want, uh, whether you want to take a salary or not, and how big, what are going to be some of your considerations? Tax. Tax, tax is very important because, uh, you may be taxed differently if you take a salary, but how much you're going to be taxed is not only going to be, well, it's not going to be determined only by how much you take as a salary, but by what other factor. Be determined by how you structure your business, right? Do you structure your business as a proprietorship? Do you structure it as a private corporation? Do you sub structure it as subchapter S corporation? Do you structure it as a C corporation? The tax laws are different. So when you make those decisions, just remember that you'll have to make a decisions when you plan this business. How do you structure your business from what form of business do you want to have? And it's not only a tax consideration, for example, whether you want to incorporate or not has a liability consideration, right? If you are not incorporated, uh, then, uh, and you go under, uh, and you have creditors that are unpaid, they can go after your personal assets, right? On the other hand, if you are incorporated, your liability is limited, so all these considerations come into play. We're not, we're usually not going to go too much in depth about estimating costs of taxes, not because they're not important, but because you have uh, specifically dedicated tax courses. So we don't want to spend too much time in the, and also I, my knowledge of taxes is general but I'm far from being an expert in taxes, so you're much better off uh, getting the tax analysis from an expert in taxes. Okay. So, now that was requirement number five. Requirement number six, uh, okay. Uh, again, arguably the opportunity cost is a real cost. And you can see, you can make it real if you pay yourself a salary, so that's, that's another proof that it's a real cost. And if you don't include opportunity cost, the problem you, is that you uh, significantly, very significantly, underestimate your cost. Because your cost without opportunity cost, your cost is very low. So you exaggerate your profitability, and if you price your jobs, A1, A2, and B1, if you price them on the basis of cost plus a markup, if your costs are very low, you may be tempted to very much underprice your product because you don't price your product to cover, in an accounting approach, you, you, you may forget to price your product to cover the value of your work if you don't include the cost of your work in that.
Okay, uh, requirement number seven is to calculate. Uh, you yes. Uh, yes. That's correct. Well, well, in most cases, we don't have to because, uh, because salaries and compensation is paid explicitly. And presumably, we're not sure, but presumably they reflect the value of work. So in most cases, uh, in most cases, in this case, this is a case where the person started, you start your own company and you work for yourself and you're the only guy there, so you have a choice whether you pay yourself or not. But in most companies, uh, the compensation is explicit and it's recognized in the accounting system as the cost, right? So, so luckily, in most situations, we don't have this dilemma, right? Okay. Uh, what we have here is just, uh, well, you know, at, you said that you... You want to price because your customers ask you how much would you charge and you decide that it's reasonable to add 30% to your costs and uh, then self-explanatory. You get the pricing and you get the profitability estimates and the prices that you ask for. The customers may agree or they may negotiate, but that's what you ask for, and based on what you ask for, uh, these are your profit estimates. There's a mistake here, I'm sorry. Uh, there's no A3, this should be B1. Okay. Assignment, uh, requirement A to ask why are you why do you need the estimates, so many estimates? Why don't you just wait and use the actuals when the actual costs and uh, the actual revenues, when they become available? And the answer is very simple, as, as we'll see time and time again. You have to plan. In other words, if you just say, I will not do any financial analysis before I have the actuals, then there's no way that you can plan, there's no way that you can decide how much I'm going to price, how many hours I'm going to put in into each product, into each customer's customer based on expected profitability. Am I going to take a customer who will pay me only a certain price? Is this customer going to be profitable or not? All these things, decisions have to be made, in many cases, ahead of time. And ahead of time, all you have is estimated figures. So you have, to, you have to do that with the estimated figures. Obviously, when you get into operations, you'll start getting actual figures. And then you compare the actuals to the estimates. And you calculate the deviations, which are known in accountants in accounting as variances and you evaluate the variances. Okay, if there are no other questions, let us move now to... Yes? Well, in the economic approach, you will, because you still incur an opportunity, you underpay yourself, you still incur an opportunity. In the accounting approach, no, because you don't care about the opportunity cost in the accounting approach. So if it's 80, it will be 80, right? You're welcome. Okay, uh, 
let's see if we can okay let's go to the lecture we are talk let's get Okay, uh, job order costing, we now would like to go through the procedures where we cost jobs. What are the procedures that we take in costing jobs in a traditional costing methods? So here the environment is that we are, we perform jobs for customers each job is different from another job because each job is customized according to customer specifications. So it may be the same product but customized different. Each job may have uh, some specific features that customers want. So let's look at, uh, let's, lo let's go through an example. The example pertains to famous valve company that manufactures automatic engine valves and um, it uses a job order costing bid. In other words, we start by the fact that it bids for a job and it bids for a job that Michigan Motors may want, that it may want to provide to Michigan Motors. And these jobs involve famous providing Michigan with 1,500 units of L181 volts. So the cost object is the particular job. That particular job of uh, 1,500 units of the L181 volts. So let's see how, well, the first thing is, the key is that in many cases, uh, you want to bid for the jobs. It may be an official bid or it may be unofficial negotiations, but you may want to explore a contract with Michigan providing them with the product. And uh, the bidding means that obviously Michigan would want to contract and part of the contract would include the price. So you have to agree on the price that uh, Famous is going to charge for those valves, for those 1,500 volts. So let's look at the bidding process. Start with a job bid sheet, one possibility. There's a job description. This is the bid number, the date, uh, uh, the customer, uh, the product, that's self-explanatory, design maybe, and the number of units. Now we start by estimating the costs so we can bid. And uh, obviously we start with the easier costs which are the direct costs and uh, among the direct inputs are materials and we want to estimate the direct cost of the materials. Well, there are two types of materials here, two types of inputs, bar steel stock three, whatever that means technically, and a sub-assembly. So you estimate that to provide 1,500 engine valves, you need 3,600 pounds of bar steel stock three and 1,500 assembly lines, sub-assembly lines, one sub-assembly per each, uh, per each engine valve. Uh, you estimate the prices that you have to pay for those inputs, and you multiply the prices by the quantities, and you get the costs, and you sum them up, 
and you get the total direct estimated direct material cost. So that's for materials. Then you estimate direct labor. And you, in direct labor, you need two type of workers. You need uh, lathe operators and assembly workers, estimated hours. Then you total them, you get total direct hours. You get the compensation rates for each category of uh, labor. You multiply the rate by the hours and you get the total compensation and the total direct labor cost in dollars. So that takes care of the direct inputs. You estimated the costs. Now, in order to price, you have to estimate the full cost. So obviously, there are also indirect inputs, or support costs, or overhead. So let's look at the support costs. Let's look here. One of the support, one of the inputs, indirect inputs, is machines. Probably the machine is doing work for many other jobs, so it's not exclusive to, uh, j to this job. The direct labor and direct materials were exclusively dedicated to this job, so that's an indirect cost. So on the, in the planning, we're in the planning stage, so we ask ourselves, what are the planned, I'm reading here, what are the planned machine support indirect costs for all supported products, all supported jobs, and you're doing many jobs, Famous is doing many jobs, including that particular job, engine valve job that we are considering. So the estimated machine costs for all the job, for a year, say, are $4 million. Then you have to decide on the cost driver that you use for the machines. And you decide that the cost driver is going to be machine hours. Because it's closely associated to the activity and the cost of the machine. The number of machine hours is the number of hours that the machine works. So we have machine hours. Then you ask yourself, how many machine hours am I planning in famous for all the jobs? And let's assume the number is 100,000. So you have the total machine cost of 4 million for all jobs the level of 100,000 machine hours for all jobs, then you can calculate the predetermined or planned cost driver rate, which is going to be calculated by dividing the 4 million by the 100,000, and you get $40 of planned machine support cost per machine hour. So that's going to be your allocation rate for the machine hours. So now you ask yourself how many machine hours will I will be needed for the job that I'm doing for the 1500 engine valves and let's see, the estimate is 600 machine hours. So you have 600 machine hours. And to allocate, so if you're going to use 600 machine hours for this job, you allocate the cost at what we estimated as $40 per machine hour and you get an allocation of $24,000 of machine cost to this particular job. So that's the machine support cost or the machine indirect cost. Now we have to do also labor indirect costs. And the labor indirect costs, the 
Cost driver for the labor in direct cost in this case is assumed or chosen to be direct labor hours. And we estimated already 1,380 direct labor hours. And in order to allocate the indirect labor hours, so remember, this is a little bit confusing. We are allocating indirect labor hours, but the cost driver that we use is direct labor hours because we assume that the indirect labor hours are allocated proportionally to the direct labor hours used for each job. So the direct labor hours used for our job, we already calculated as 1,380. We have to multiply it by the allocation rate of the indirect labor hours per hour of direct labor, which is our cost driver. And the number is 36. It's not shown explicitly how it's calculated, but it's calculated the same way as the $40. You take the total, you ask yourself, what is the total indirect what is the total indirect labor cost that I will encounter for all, that famous will encounter for all jobs? And what are the total direct labor hours for all jobs? You divide the total indirect labor hours to the total direct labor hours for all job, and you get an allocation rate, presumably of $36 of indirect labor hours per direct labor hour, and you use this 36 the same way as you use the 40. So you get the allocation of indirect labor hours to this particular job. And you sum them up and you get the total applied or allocated support cost for this job. Now once you have done that, you've taken account of all the costs. So now you can add up direct estimated direct material, direct labor, and applied support or indirect costs for this job, and you get that the total estimated cost of providing these 1,500 volts to Michigan is 201,540. And then if you decide that you want to add a 25% target markup over cost in your pricing. So you add 25% of the estimated cost and you get a bid price for the job of 251,925 dollars. So that's one way that you can bid based on your total estimated costs plus a target or a desired markup of 25%. Then the unit cost, the cost per unit for this bid is going to be the total cost for the job divided by the number of units, or $134.36. And the price per unit is going to be $167.95. So then you proceed to bid. The bid may be accepted or may be rejected. The customer may reject it and said, I have a much better bid. I really don't want to deal with you. Or the customer may say, I like Famous. I like you as a company. I heard good things about you, but uh, this price is too high. Let's negotiate. And they may either agree or disagree. But that's basically the story ahead of time. So any questions? Okay, uh, then let us assume, just for the sake of the story, that this bid was accepted. And now we go into production to deliver. And now the story goes that the contract is for 1,500 units the vaults, 1,500, but the customer doesn't need all of them at once. So within the contract, the first order 
is for a batch of 290 units. So the customer orders a batch of 290 units and uh, we, uh, the famous Michigan orders and we the famous company are scrambling to deliver. So one thing we start is we requisition materials. So we requisition bar steel stock three and we requisition for the 290 units 720 pounds of bar steel stock three. At 11, we pay $11.50 per unit, total amount 8,280 units. Now here, these numbers are already actual numbers because that's where, that's operations, that's actual operations. We're really requisitioning this material. So all the numbers here, the quantities, the prices, and the cost are now not estimated numbers, they're real, they're actual numbers. So, we tally up the costs, the bar steel, we just repeat it, uh, we put the assembly in, 290 units of sub-assemblies for 200, a batch of, batch of 290 units ordered, the rate for the sub-assemblies is $38, the amount is 11020 and the total direct material cost actual for the 290 units is 19,300. Then we proceed to put the labor required to work on these materials to produce the valves. Uh, we have the dates that are worked. Uh, we have the working, the workers number of each worker. M stands for workers that are machinists and A stands for workers that are assembly workers. And the numbers are for different workers. Then the hours that those workers put in. The rates are different because they're different levels of experience in different categories of workers. And then we multiply the hours by the rate, we get the cost, we add them up, and the total direct labor cost is $5,516, again, actual. Just around the data is recorded in time cards, times, hours worked, and you just, you know, just have to be uh, accurate in recording the data. Okay, so we recorded the direct labor costs. But what about the indirect costs? We want also to record the indirect costs for those uh, 290 units. Well, we ask ourselves how many machine hours we use to produce 290 units. We, should, we can get actual numbers. Uh, machine hours are recorded, so we get that 117 machine hours were put to produce exclusively, specifically, those 290 units. And the direct labor hours, which is uh, a cost driver for the indirect labor, we know we put 268 hours, we calculated that before. But now, what are the rates? We don't have actual. These numbers are actual, 117, 268. But the rates, we don't have actual numbers because remember how we derived the actual numbers when we did the estimated rates, 40 and 36. We asked how much it will take us in machines. We asked how much would it take us to produce all jobs for the entire period, the entire cycle, and the estimate was four million. How many machine hours will take us to work for all jobs? And the estimate was 100,000. We divided four million by 100,000, we got 40. 
But we still have to work with the 40 estimated because we don't have actual number to substitute for it because to have the actual number we would have to know what is the total number, what is the total cost of the machines for all the jobs for the entire accounting cycle. But we are just at the beginning and we just are doing part of one job. So in order to get the actual machine cost incurred for all the jobs for the uh, entire accounting cycle, say a year, uh, we'll have to wait until the end of the year. But we want to cost as we go. We don't want to wait and cost until we finish all the job of 1,500 units. We want to cost the 290. So in order to cost the 290, we still have to use the estimated or the budgeted number of $40 and uh, $36 per direct labor hour. We use those numbers, we multiply the quantities by the numbers, we get the allocated, the applied or allocated support cost to the 290 units. But bear in mind, the support or indirect costs allocated are not pure numbers, they're hybrid numbers. One component of those numbers, the quantities are actual, and one component of those numbers is budgeted. So, these numbers are hybrids. So, now, that we keep that in mind, we have the total applied costs of $39,144, that includes the direct and indirect, the number of units for the batch is 290, and the applied cost per unit is 134.98. Just divide the 39.144 by the number of units. Now what is important, having done that, we can now, which is very important, is to compare the applied cost per unit for the 29, 290 units to what we estimated when we bid for the job for the 1500 units. And here, the picture in this example is a pretty picture. We are coming very close. In other words, our cost of doing the 290 units per unit are very close cents away from our estimated cost when we bid for the whole job of 1500 units. But this is very important to know. How we are doing? Are we close to our estimated target when we bid the job? Let's assume that we weren't close. Let's assume that this number, instead of being 134, would be $180 per unit. Then we say, now wait a minute. In the first 290 units that we are doing, we have huge cost overruns compared to what we estimated compared to what we based our bid on, right? Our price bid on. Price is based on this, right? And now, let's assume we're doing 180. We are running away in terms of cost overruns. We're in trouble if we continue this way. We're going to lose money on this job. So we have to figure out how we reconfigure and reduce our costs, or we have to renegotiate the price if we can with our customer. So this is why doing these things is important to cost the jobs as you run them. Because otherwise you can say, oh, why, why do we bother using hybrid numbers and why do we need to cost the jobs when we run them? Let's just sit quietly and wait until the end of the year. By the end of the year we will have all actual jobs. We will have the cost of the machines for all the jobs, 
the cost of indirect labor for all the jobs, we would be able to have actual numbers, and that's that. The answer to that is that managerially, you don't have to wait, you don't want to wait until the end of the year and find out, maybe, that you had huge cost overruns, for example, and that you lost rather than made profit in a job. You want to catch it as you go. And in order to catch it as you go, you have to cost as you go. And when you cost as you go, for allocating the indirect inputs and the indirect costs, what you have to do is you have to use hybrid numbers. You have to use actual quantities, which are the cost drivers, cost driver levels, times, times actual quantities, times actual levels of the cost drivers, 117 machine hours, 268 direct labor hours, times predetermined or planned cost driver rates. Yeah. You ask why, why, why we shouldn't wait? Why we shouldn't wait? Because if we wait, we may not be able to take timely action to rectify situations which get out of control. If we wait, we will know at the end of the year that we had big cost overruns on this job and other jobs maybe, and we lost money. But if you, do, if you do the cost analysis as you go and compare it with your estimate, if you do that, if you do, the, if you do this comparison, if you do this comparison of the cost per unit between estimated based on the bid and the applied cost for the batch of 290, you know whether you're on target or not. Well, in this case, you are on target, so you can smile. But in case you're not on target, you have cost overruns, you have time to correct things. Because you delivered only 290 units, you still have a lot of units to deliver until you get to 1,500, right? So you have time to collect things, to, to correct things. If you wait until the end, you won't have time to correct things. You just have to say, oh, I did well, or oh, I screwed up, right? No, I think you misunderstand my question. Okay. I mean, uh, like okay. The cost driver rate, uh, you said we have to wait at the end of the yeah. counting cycle to calculate the actual cost driver rate. Yes. No, we don't have them. Because in order to get the $40, that's precisely the point. You see, let's, let's take the $40, right? Let's take this number, the $40. Remember how we calculated that? Uh, let me see, where does it go? No, that's the 117. Wait a minute. When the actual direct, 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 I want to go to the indirect. Recording actual direct, uh, applying support costs, right. Okay. Uh, I have to go one. Wait a minute. 40, the 40, where did we calculate the 40 when it was the 4 million? I'm looking for that. Am I missing the... Uh, 
This is the 40, the 40, uh, this is, uh, no, this is the direct, uh, this is the 40, okay, I'm missing it, but uh, you remember how to, I can't find it now, but how do we calculate the 40? We said, uh, we said, uh, how much is the cost of the machine for the whole year? I'm sorry? 10? Okay, but remember, the way we calculated the 40, we said uh, the cost of the machine is 4 million. We estimated it to be 4 million, but we don't have, but when we deliver 290 units, we don't have the 4 million, we don't have an actual number for the 4 million. Because the actual number for the 4 million, which is the cost, the total cost, of machine used for all jobs for the entire period will be available only at the end of the period. So we don't have the 4 million, right? So we can calculate, we can substitute for the 40 an actual number, right? Because we don't know the cost, what will be the actual cost at this point when we deliver the 290 units we don't know what will be the total cost of the machine used for all jobs for the entire period. We will know it only in the end of the period. So we can't, we can't have, for the 40, we can't have the actual numbers. So we have to use an estimated number. Now, of course, what happens then is that at the end of the accounting, it's not that the actuals are not important. At the end of the accounting period, we will have the actuals. And then we do a reconciliation. Remember, we used, when we, when we deliver the 290 units and we're going to deliver another 150 units, we used a hybrid number, actual cost driver rate and times uh, times estimated allocation, now we will have the actual numbers and we'll compare to actual numbers to the allocated indirect costs and we will calculate the differences and do a reconciliation. So there are three stages. At the bidding stage, we are using only estimate numbers because we have to estimate the cost for bidding for the prices and estimate the profitability of the, the pr estimate, uh, estimate the profitability of the jobs and tell the customers what prices we want to charge and agree on the prices. So at the beginning, before we start operating, we do everything, all the costing on an estimated basis. Then as we deliver 290 units and another maybe 150 units, as we deliver, we do costing that is based partly on actual and for the indirect cost on estimates to compare how we are doing in terms of cost per unit relative to what we bid, what we estimated when we bid, are we, are we on target in terms of our estimates or are we diverging from target? And finally, at the end of the period, we apply the actual numbers and we reconcile everything. So that's basically the common way to do job order costing. And, and the reason we do it this way is to stay for cost management. We want to manage our costs and stay in control as we deliver. So if we run into trouble, if we run, say, into cost overruns, we want to have time to react before the end of the period. Okay. If there are no uh, questions here, would I like to do any more questions? I'd like now to move to the case. So... I'm going to move to assignments. I'd like to move to
Okay, the purpose of case number two is to acquaint you with the differences between traditional costing and activity-based costing, and to compare, compare the two and acquaint you the differences and the relative merits of one relative to the other. Now, to do that, we invoke a simple case of a low-tech company, Cooper's Pen, Cooper's Pens, and uh, Cooper's, Cooper produces pens, literally. And uh, according to the columns here, you see they produce four type of pens. The traditional bread and butter pens, which are blue and black, and they just started introducing two new colors, which are red and purple. So you could see by the quantities, the bulk of their production, 50,000, 40,000, is blue and black. And then they started producing red and purple. Now, in table one, you have a profitability analysis based on traditional costing. By traditional costing, we mean a traditional approach to allocating overhead. And remember, overhead and indirect costs and support costs are all the same. It's this, they're used interchangeably. So when we say overhead, it's the same like saying indirect costs or support costs. So the overhead are allocated here to the product or the indirect costs are allocated to the products based on a traditional costing method, which we are going to specify in a moment. Let's go over the numbers. So you have units price, dollar sales or revenues, direct materials, direct labor, overhead, total manufacturing costs. Difference between total manufacturer revenues and total manufacturer costs is gross margin. And then to calibrate for the differences in the volume of the products, you have a calculation of gross margin as a percentage of sale. So you have a, a profitability indicator here, the bottom line. And uh, this profitability indicator shows you that based on traditional cost allocations of overhead, if you believe this allocation, then you would conclude that uh, all the products are profitable. They're all in the red. All are solidly profitable. But red, red and purple are more profitable than blue and black. Now, of course, remem remember that Usually the questionable number here is the allocation of the overhead. Because the other costs are direct costs. So if you don't make mistakes, you, if you don't make mistakes in recording them and assigning them, they're easy to assign because they're exclusive to uh, the cost object, which is the pens, the products, the pens. So the question, if we have any question in terms of the quality of the number, numbers here, the profitability numbers, it zeroes in, it centers on the overhead of the indirect costs. Okay, now you have a description of uh, the traditional production system, which involves uh, three steps. Preparing and mixing the ink in different color pens, insert, inserting the ink into the pens in a semi-automated process, and then packing and shipping the pens manual stage. What is important is what is how does the traditional cost accounting system work in terms of the allocation of indirect costs? Cooper uses its plant as a single cost center where it accumulates all the costs 
in the plant, and all indirect support costs of the plant are aggregated or were aggregated at the plant level, and what is important here, into one cost pool, pool has to be P-O-O-L, one cost, not P-U-L-L, -L, to one cost pool, and, uh, and then from this cost pool, it's allocated to the products, the different colors of pens, based on each product's direct labor cost. So you look at the direct labor cost of each product and you s allocate the, all the indirect costs of everything that is, all the indirect activities in direct proportion to the labor, direct labor cost of each product. So this is a quick and dirty primitive assumption. But its advantage is that it's simple and requires simple calculations. So currently the cost system overhead, indirect cost allocation or burden rate, whatever call it, really allocation rate, is 300% of direct labor costs. So we have 300% of direct labor costs, which means the indirect support costs were allocated at a rate of at a rate of $3 per $1 of direct labor cost. So for each $1 of direct labor cost in each type of pen, you allocate $3 of indirect costs. In other words, the assumption is that the ratio is 3 to 1, and the ratio is the same for all types of pens, which need not be the case. But it's as simple as they call it, quick and dirty assumption, which uh, is typical of traditional cost accounting systems. Now, so no wonder that the management is troubled with the profitability analysis because it's not sure that using this system that the allocation of the indirect costs to the products is a good allocation because the assumption here is very arbitrary. Why should all indirect costs vary proportionately to direct labor dollars is something that is not easy to explain. It doesn't have to be the case just makes it easy to calculate, but it often doesn't have any inherent rationale. So, in addition, uh, Cooper moves to a more complex production system where uh, the process is automized, particularly the injection of the pens is now to ejection of the, of the ink to the pens is now automated, not semi-automated. And also we know that there are different indirect activities at a different level pertaining to each product. Just to give one example, if you switch from a batch of blue ink pens, manufacturing blue ink pens, to a batch of manufacturing black ink pens, the cleaning that goes from the residual of the blue to the production of the black is not very hard and not very lengthy because the black color overwhelms the blue. So if there are residuals of blue, you just do superficial cleaning, then you just pour the black and it overwhelms the residuals of the blue. But if, you, if your previous batch was black and you want to move to red and purple, you have to do a much more thorough cleaning. So your setup costs and your setup hours are different. So there are different support indirect costs and different support indirect inputs <coughs> for the different pens. So we know that the assumption <coughs> of, the, 
of allocating everything by the same rate may be questionable. Well, that's why <coughs> Cooper decides to, in this story, to move to activity-based costing. And you're asked in this case to follow the activity-based costing method and do the calculations and analyze some of the numbers. Now, in table two, you have uh, the first stage of activity-based costing is identifying in detail the sequence of activities that are used to produce a product or a service, in this case, pens. And uh, you have to do a very careful analysis of what are the major activities and identify them and describe them after careful analysis. In this case, it's assumed they've already been done and uh, by the experts. And uh, the activities that are identified as the major activities are handling the production runs, setting up the machines, supporting the product, running the machines, and providing fringe benefits to labor. Now, usually that's not a typical example, because usually when you do detailed activity analysis, you will have not just five ma sequence of five activities, but you'll have a sequence of many more activities. But that's just for the sake of keeping the example short and simple. Okay, now the first stage is the activity analysis. The second stage, which is already done too, is identifying and choosing the appropriate activity cost drivers for each activity the most appropriate for each activity. So, it happens that for handling production runs, the most appropriate cost driver that was cho chosen was the number of production runs. For setting up machines is the number of setup hours. For supporting the products, the number of products. For running the machines, the number of machine hours worked. There's the number of hours that the machine worked. And for providing fringe benefits, labor dollars. So the activity-based costing, the activity cost drivers have been chosen. So these are all inputs to your case. Now, the third, uh, the third phase of activity-based costing is to specify the cost driver requirements per product unit and the cost driver levels for each activity. So you have the activities in this column. And you have the activity and the cost driver per unit. So direct labor hours required per unit, first line, for each product are 0 0.02. In total, 2,000, because 0 0.02 per unit, you multiply by 50,000 plus 0 0.02 by 40,000, and so on. You get a total of 2,000. Machine hour units are 0 0.1 across the board for all products per unit of the product, per pen, that is. And you multiply by the number of pens, so you get altogether 10,000. For blue, it will be 5 0.1 of 50,000. For blue, which uh, is going to be 5,000, 0.1 of 40,000, with black 4,000. 0.1 of 9,000 for red is 180, and 0.1 for 1,000. For purple is 20, you add them up, you get, you add them up and you, excuse me, 0.1, no, 0.1 for, no, let's do it again. 0.1 for 50,000 is what? 0.1 for 50,000 is 5,000. Plus 0 0.1 for 4,000 is 4,000. It's 9,000. Plus 0 0.1 for 9,000 is 900. 9,900. 
times 0 0.1 for 1,000 is 100, 9,900 and 100 is a total of 10,000. Now total runs required for each product is specified, estimate and specified, 7065 for blue and black, 50 for red, 15 for purple. Uh, notice that relative to the number of units produced of red and purple, the number of runs required is high relative to the number of pens produced. Setup time, hours per run. The smallest setup time is for black because the cleaning time needed to switch to black as we discussed is lower, is low, higher for blue and the highest for red and purple. Total setup hours are, is the product multiply product number of runs times the set up hours per run. 70 times 4, you get 280. Products, uh, it's one product per, each product is a product, so it's one, one, one. Totally, there are four products. And these are just a reminder of the number of pens produced. Okay, then we, based on all of this data, you get to requirement number one for the case, and that is to compute the ACDRs in table four. Now, let me tell you what ACDRs are. ACDRs, A stands for activity, C stands for, co C stands for cost, D stands for drivers, and R stands for rate. So ACDRs are activity cost driver rates. So you have to calculate the activity cost driver rates per each activity and for that you need to find the cost driver quantity for each activity which is specified earlier. If you divide the activity cost for each activity by the driver quantity you get the ACDR. But what is important in this table and already done, it's a very important stage of the activity-based costing, and that is that once the activities were identified, we pool the cost into activity cost pools. What, that, what does that mean? You identify the cost of all, of each, per, cost associated with each particular activity. For example, the activity here is handling production runs. You ask yourself, what are all the costs associated with handling production runs? You do a cost analysis, you find, identify all these costs, you sum up the numbers, and you get to 66,000. So you have pulled together all the costs associated with production, handling production runs, and this is 66,000. You pull all the costs associated with handling setup machines, and so on, so you get the activity cost pools, what you're required to require in one is to calculate the activity cost driver rates for each activity. Because it's a very important part of activity-based costing. Now once you've done that, you're ready to do the main part of activity-based costing. And that's in requirement number two, which pertains to table five. Compute the activity costs assigned from activity cost pools, which are here, assigned from activity cost pools to cost objects. So here are the cost objects. Here are the cost objects. And now you can do, on the basis of all the numbers that you have and you calculated, you can allocate uh, the cost of handling production which in total are 66,000, you can allocate them based on the activity cost driver rates to how much of the handling production runs cost, how much of it goes to blue, how much goes to black, how much goes to red, and how much goes to purple. Set up machine costs, total you have here, 33,600. 
how much of that should be allocated to blue, black, red, and purple, and so on. And then you do the total cost, total indirect cost assigned to each of those activities. So you get here that on the bottom line. Now this bottom line, once you calculate it, are the total support costs and you then transfer them to this transfer them to this column and that's uh, requirement three compute ABC profitability rates well the sales are the same as they always were the direct materials and direct labor are the same 40% uh, fringe Costs of fringes of fringe uh, labor benefits are 40 percent of direct labor. They already calculated for you. So all you have is to allocate the to put in the support costs, which you calculated here, per each product, and then calculate the total manufacturing expense, the gross margin, and the gross margin as percentage of sales. So now you will have a profitability analysis based on ABC, not based on traditional costing because you have done activity-based costing and the numbers that you're going to be putting here, the support or indirect cost numbers, are going to be based on activity-based costing. So in four, you're asked to compare Cooper's ABC profitability, which you just calculate to report, to Cooper's traditional profitability report, which is table number one, and discuss which profitability report is likely to be more accurate and why. That's uh, requirement four. Now, in requirement five, you asked if indeed, well, if really indeed you think that the ABC results, activity-based costing results, improve performance, how can Cooper use those results to improve its performance in terms of its product mix policies and other policies relating to the production and marketing of those pens? So that's requirement five. Requirement six has to do with the following, following reality. ABC, you may discover that ABC is a better system more sophisticated produces, likely to produce more accurate results. So simple, why don't we all switch to ABC? Well, as all good things, there's no free lunch. So ABC may be a better system, may improve your results, the accuracy of your results, the quality of your results, but it is costly. So when companies want to switch from traditional costing to ABC, they have to do a cost-benefit analysis. They have to ask themselves, what is the cost of doing so and what are the benefits and compare to each other? So that's where requirement six, where requirement six comes in. If ABC results bring to changes in Cooper strategies, Please design a procedure for estimating the value added of the ABC information to Cooper relative to the additional cost of ABC implementation. Please describe the major cost and value added components. So the idea here, you don't have numbers. So you can do a cost-benefit analysis with numbers. You don't have numbers for the Im incremental cost of implementing ABC or the incremental value but you can identify cost categories. What are the major categories of improving, what are the major categories of the value added of ABC compared to the major cost, incremental cost categories of implementing this program? So you, you just specify how you build the structure of uh, a good, cost-benefit analysis for ABC.